welcome. So we will go ahead and get started. I know a couple of people messaged me that they weren't able to attend um, last week. Um, so we, I did record last week's session at the end. Um, after our last one, I'm going to send out an email um, with all the recordings in it just to the people who signed up for this training um, with the PowerPoint slides and any resources that we discussed so that you have it to go back and reference if you would like. Um, I do want to just get started with um, letting you know some upcoming events. This is just always, I go through this stuff in case anybody wants to volunteer or if they want ideas and kind of ways that they can engage and volunteer. Um, so in California, we have the Aging Conference on May 20th. It's in LA. Um, we're still looking for some volunteers if anyone here is in the LA area. Um, we're going to have some other volunteers there tabling, but they're always welcoming new people if you want to go and meet some people. Um, we have two volunteers putting on an event um, in San Diego, um, community gatherings for advanced healthcare planning. Um, that also they do it in bilingual. Um, so that will be May 15th at 1130. Um, Mitz, he is one of our action team leaders from San Diego. He uh, does a death talk on Zoom. Um, but it's open to anyone. I know Cindy lives in Texas and she has joined before. Um, this one is called All Things Funeral Meetup. Um, so you're welcome to join these at any time. And I'll send the link out for his, but he'll go over a whole bunch of different topics all the time. Um, if anyone here is from San Diego, we're doing an action team meeting in person where Leslie and I will both be there um, on June 2nd. Um, we're looking for volunteers to help uh, table at LA Pride on June 9th and 10th. And then in Sacramento, where there's a senior health care or health fair, um, September 23rd from 10 to 4, and we're looking for volunteers for that one. Next slide. Um, in Colorado, um, if anyone here is from Colorado, we have a Zoom meeting on June 3rd. Um, it's always the first Wednesday of each month. Um, at 4 p.m. Mountain Stand or Mountain Time, um, all volunteers are always welcome to attend, and it's just a time when we check in with each other. Um, we have Denver Pride Fest June 24th and June 25th, um, so we're looking for volunteers to vol to volunteer to table at that. Um, if anyone here is from Nevada, we're running a campaign right now to pass medical aid and dying. Um, so if you're not involved in that and you want to get involved in that. Um, I have Rid and Nico's email up there, or you can email me and I'll connect you with them. In Texas, uh, we have the Austin Pride, uh, which is I'm August 12th, years. and we're looking for volunteers for that. Um, and then Utah, there is a film called Last Flight Home. They'll be screening that in Salt Lake City on June 17th. Um, they're still working on the final information. Um, oh, great. Um, I'll email you, Cam, now with about Austin Pride. Um, and then we have some national webinars coming up. So that I'll put it in the chat um, here in a second. Let's see. Compassion. For the national webinars, if you want to sign up for any of these to join in, um, I'm going to put the link in here where you can find it. So for the national webinars, um, if you go to this link and then you just scroll down a little bit, it will say upcoming events. And if you scroll down just a little bit lo lower, it'll give you all of the national webinars and different webinars in different regions where we're having events. Um, next. And then as a reminder, um, we have next Friday, May 19th um, from 12 to one mountain time. We're going to do documenting your end of life preferences for training the advocate. And then Friday, May 26th from 12 to 1 Mountain Time, we're doing the dementia directive and call to action. Okay, so today um, we are going to, if everyone can make sure that they're on mute for right now, um, we are going to talk about how to talk about medical aid and dying. Um, and so at the end of this, we'll go through this, it'll take about 20 minutes. And then at the end, we're gonna, depending on how many people we have, we might stay as one large group or we can break into little groups. And what we often hear from people is 
they're not sure how to answer certain questions if they go out and do presentations or if they're talking, you know, to different community members. Um, so we have had we've picked four questions that um, we have gotten during presentations that we're going to ask you all to kind of brainstorm how to respond to it. Um, so we're going to spend the last bit of our train the advocate today doing the brainstorming and working as a group. Um, so next, okay. So we're gonna start talking about general audiences. So our core group that we want to work with are volunteers, donors, healthcare allies, legislative champions, and our other partners. With these groups, we want to move them to take action. So our messaging should reflect that. So to grow our movement, we need to talk about the movable middle. So the movable middle are those that have um, not thought about death or medical aid in dying or have conflicted feelings about it. These are, these are the people that we wanna really engage to help through, grow the movement. Next. So we all have our views and reasons for supporting medical aid in dying. Remember that when you're speaking to groups or friends and families, your objective is to move those people in the middle. We know that sometimes our personal views or particular use of language is not always the most effective way to do that. That is what I'm going to talk about today. So it's not to negate your views, it's about being an effective advocate and influencer. So we wanna think about the audience when, we, when we're going and speaking and use examples that will resonate with them. For example, when speaking to a general audience, Talk about caring for parents or other loved ones. Examples of different kinds of audience, you have the general public, you have members of a faith-based community, you have healthcare community, et cetera. So this is the key message and worth memorizing. So terminally ill adults should be able to make their own end of life care decisions based on their values and priorities in consultation with their doctor, their loved ones, and faith spiritual leaders, if they have one. So you also wanna make sure that you share any family support and stories. The reason we wanna talk about family support is because people will assume a lack of support if it's not mentioned. People tend to fill in the blanks with the worst possible scenario. For example, we avoid using the clinical term self-administer because research shows that people think that this means the terminally ill person must inject the medication, which they do not, um, and we don't want to imply that. So as a result, we use the term self-ingest. So it's clear to people and they understand that there's no injection involved. And then you will never go wrong when you take the high road. We do not want to attack opposition. We focus on personal stories and facts. Um, so it, sometimes when people are tabling and somebody will come up to them and say like, oh, I don't agree with this. Um, we just say like, okay, like, you know, that's fine. And we don't always, we don't ever encourage people to start arguing with people if you're out tabling. So don't attack religious institutions or beliefs. So some people may want to argue about separation of church and state or the morality of medical options. If we attack anyone's church, we undermine that support because people tend to defend groups that they are part of um, when the group is attacked. Don't blame doctors. Um, so most physicians support medical aid in dying, and we want to work to build that support in the medical community. Remember, physicians have the options to opt out, and we need to respect their personal decisions. Our concern is when a physician is prohibited from, practic from practicing medical aid in dying due to their healthcare institution or some other policy. It is important to remember that the issues we discussed relate to a system problem and blaming doctors will only alienate them. We have heard people blame doctors for their push for continued medical intervention or other issues. And please remember that when we're doing presentations or talking in the community, we don't wanna alien alienate doctors when we're presenting. So leave room for people to change their mind. 
So again, there's no need to argue. Simply state why you believe medical aid and dying should be authorized and then listen. Leave people room to change their mind. I've heard it said that people are often one bad death away from agreeing that medical aid and dying should be authorized. So remember, it's the disease or illness that is ending the person's life. For this reason, we should avoid saying things like life ending medication or taking medication to end one's life because it implies suicide. We prefer the term medical aid in dying to physician assisted dying because the latter term implies that the doctor administers the medication, as is with the case of euthanasia. Compassion and Choices does not support euthanasia, which is illegal nationwide, because the patient doesn't administer the medication themselves. And then explain what happens to people when the medication is ingested. So the person ingests medication, usually by mixing it in water and drinking it directly out of a glass or using a straw. If the person is unable to swallow, they can use a feeding tube to ingest the medication. Their breathing slows down and then they drift off to sleep, usually within minutes until eventually their breathing stops. Um, usually it takes an hour or two and that it is a peaceful death. So clarify why people want the option of medical aid in dying. Try not to define reasons too narrowly. While fear of pain is a reason that people want the option of medical aid in dying, it is actually not the most common one. The top three reasons um, dying people cite are loss of autonomy, no pleasure in living, and loss of dignity. While these reasons have everything to do with suffering, they do not include physical pain. As a result, when talking about the reasons people choose medical aid in dying, we should talk about pain and symptom management. And then framing the issue. So there, although very few people use this option, medical aid in dying has been shown to benefit the terminally ill in general. Medical aid in dying laws for earlier, more frequent conversations between terminally ill adults their doctors and loved ones about end of life care options and better utilization of hospice and palliative care. Simply having the option of medical aid and dying available can decrease fears and the feeling of powerlessness that individuals dying from terminal illness often report, enabling them to live out their final days as fully as possible. And then as the slide says, the relatively few people um, less than 1% ultimately request and take aid and dying medication. Um, but many people indirectly benefit from this. And as we talked about last week, of the less than 1% that will request this, um, about 36% of the people get the medication and then never take it. But it just helps them with decreased anxiety, usually around the end of life. So stories can show that someone who starts off not supporting or not knowing their position to supporting medical aid and dying can be very powerful. Messages that are too certain, lack nuance, and fail to mirror a person's inner conflict can alienate people. That's why we talk about options. So again, leaving room for people to change their mind. So this is an example of a journey story from California's uh, previous governor, Jerry Brown. So in California, Jerry Brown signed a medical aid and dying law on October 5th um, after it passed the state legislature in 2015. And so this is California Governor Jerry Brown's statement upon signing this law and other is another good example of how to model support for the option of medical aid and dying even if you're personally conflicted about whether a person would use this option. So he had said when he signed the law, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill. And I won't deny that right to others. So medical aid in dying is not suicide. So it's very important to make this distinction between medical aid in dying and suicide. So use messages that help people distinguish between suicide and medical aid in dying. People who seek medical aid in dying want to live, but are being robbed of life by their terminal illness. 
they are suffering life ending from a life ending disease and understand their condition is no longer treatable. There is no hope for a better outcome and death is inevitable. Um, sometimes when I've seen people also go and present, they'll maybe try to start talking about what suicide is and what it isn't. Um, and my best advice is just stating that it is not suicide. Um, there are advocacy groups that work around suicide prevention. Um, and, you know, you never want to upset somebody else's feelings if they know somebody who's completed suicide. So when I talk about this, I only talk about that medical aid and dying is not suicide. And the reason why it is not suicide being that people are already dying. Um, sorry, I'm letting somebody in. Um, that people are already dying um, and the disease is killing them. Also, uh, death certificates for somebody who takes medical aid and dying will list the um, disease as the cause of death. It doesn't list suicide or medical aid and dying. It will list the disease itself. So urgency. People are suffering right now and need this compassionate option right now. This message applies to legislators who say that they have other priorities. We need to create a sense of urgency to move to action. So make a case for a terminally ill adult within, with six months or less to live needs lawmakers to authorize medical aid and dying before it's too late for them to use it peacefully to end their suffering. The most compelling call to action results from stories shared by those who are terminally ill right now. Their loved ones can also make the urgency call. The talking points for this would be medical aid and dying is an urgent issue for terminally ill adults who cannot wait for relief from unbearable suffering in their final days. Without this option, many terminally ill people will suffer needlessly instead of dying peacefully. So proactively promote the positive outcomes for medical aid and dying. Our research also tells us that sharing the facts about Oregon's Death with Dignity Act can help allay the fears of the fears the audience may have around medical aid and dying and how it works in practice. For example, in Oregon, end of life care has improved overall since implementation of the Death with Dignity Act, in large part due to the dialogue the act encourages between people and their doctors. And I just want to, if you're not familiar with um, too much with the Oregon law, it's now been around for more than 25 years. Um, so a lot of time we'll talk about all the data that we have collected from Oregon over the past 25 years. So avoid using rights language for general audiences. We have found that people resonate more with values language than rights language, which is why we do not use the term right to die. And then avoid language that may discount or show, show lack of respect for people living with disabilities. We don't wanna show disrespect to those who live with disabilities every day. Many people live meaningful and productive life and function, with functional impairments. It's about being specific and about the, about the impact of the disease on the terminally ill person without having any judgment. Do we have any questions? I do. Yes. Um, the, the part about um, not attacking uh, religions or doctors or the medical establishment, but when we're talking about the history, and I'm frequently asked to talk about the history, uh, I have always thought, and I always preface it by saying, um, I am not condemning the Catholic Church. I'm simply explaining to you how they have opposed this and i go into the history are you saying not to even do that no we say that too we will say stuff like that but typically what i'll also say is we have polling that like 75 percent of people who are catholic support right. medical aid and dying laws um it's just the church is against it so that's fine to say it's just sometimes people if you're um presenting and I, I'll say that to people. So it feels, I feel like that makes it sound less as an attack 
if you say like the polling shows that 75% of people who, you know, identify as Catholic support medical aid and dying, sounds less of an attack on the Catholic church. But I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I think in general, people know that like there's different stances all within the Catholic church and individuals. Well, yeah, I always bring that statistic up and it really does amaze a lot of people. Mm-hmm. We talk about that a lot too with um, like Catholic hospitals um, that are purchasing smaller hospitals right? Um, and that will have an influence because they have, they have their own end of life policies. Um, so just educating people on that, but not necessarily saying this is evil and this is bad, but oh, they yeah. have their own end of life policies that they have to follow. And people that work like doctors and we, I mean, Catholic hospitals do provide excellent care um, or they can, you know, vary from hospital to hospital. Um, but, you know, people that work in Catholic hospitals also aren't necessarily Catholics themselves. So again, not attacking the doctors because they have to follow those policies, but that it's a system. So the directives. Uh, mm-hmm. And my last question is, um, I've never heard about this feeding tube. Um, could you explain how that is done in the states where it's legal now, uh, where if, if it's an ALS patient, um, uh, does a doctor come in and put the feeding tube in or a nurse and then they give the person a syringe or how is that done? Yeah, you know, I'll have to get more information exactly on how it's done, but it will have to be the person initiating it. Um, there's some other ways that you can also do it to it with ALS or if you've stopped um, when people aren't able to swallow um, that I'm not as super clear on. Um, I'm more familiar with the mixing of it, but it definitely oh. has to be the person would have to initiate it. Right. But they don't have, from what I understand, they don't have to actually mix it, but they do have to uh, drink it. Or mm-hmm. as you're saying now, which is terrific news because I hadn't heard this, uh, using a feeding tube for because mm-hmm. uh, I get a lot of questions by ALS people, and uh, of course I first have to explain that Texas doesn't have this, but that if they choose to go to another state, um, now I can explain it better. Thanks. Yeah. Can I? Uh, can I? come in here, Angela, as I had a feeding tube at one stage to feed myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, a feeding tube is a tube that's put into the stomach through the abdominal wall. It's placed there by a surgeon. It's a relatively minor procedure, but a tube is put in place and it's sewn onto the skin. And it's just basically a pipe with a cap on it uh, and one squirts whatever one wants into the tube uh, for people that can't swallow. Uh, You can also put medications in it. Some people prefer to have ready-made formulae that look a bit like uh, Boost or those other drinks that people, nutritious drinks that people live. Uh, I used to uh, mix up my own food in in a food blender and uh, it's perfectly simple and straightforward and a bit like having a colostomy after a few days one forgets one even has the tube and it's not visible to other people i eventually was able to swallow again after my surgery and uh, just had the tube pulled out it sealed in a couple of days it sounds pretty dramatic but for anyone that can't swallow it's a life-saving and very comfortable device Thank you, Hans, for sharing that. We have other questions? Okay, we can, um, if you wanna go to the next slide, we can go, I think, do you guys wanna stay as a large group and discuss? What, how we would answer this? Because there's only um, 13 people, including Leslie and I. So we can stay as one group and go through all the questions together if you want. Yes, I would vote yes. Okay. I would Me vote too. yes. Okay. Um, so 
the first question um, will say, so the, again, these are all questions that um, mm -hmm. my coworkers and I have gotten when we have been out presenting. Um, so this happened to a coworker of mine. So the question is, you are speaking at a library and there are several people in the back who are in wheelchairs. At the start of the Q&A, a person in a wheelchair raises their hand and asks, how can you condone medical aid in dying? It is a way for doctors and insurance companies to allocate end of life care and people with disabilities will be the ones who suffer. This will lead to health care rationing. Um, I will put this question in here so you guys can read it in case people prefer to read instead of have me answer. So let's start with just thinking about um, what issues do you, do you think that we should think about when we're thinking about how to respond to this? Well, first of all, it seems like you have to point out that it's to use it, it has to be initiated by the patient and administered by the patient. Uh, and it requires confirmation of at least typically, I guess, at least two doctors or healthcare providers that you have less than six months to live and you're terminally ill. So this, a person with disability certainly, it couldn't affect them unless they had a terminal illness. Is that Bill, if that's you speaking? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I thought so. Can you see, can you not see me? No. I can't see you. You can't? I see like your living room, maybe. Oh, okay. I'm in my living room. I, I, I don't have any picture here, so I didn't know whether there was a picture of me there or whether I'm just a voice out of a box, but either way, that's the way, I, that, that would be my response. Yeah, I'm in the living room. Okay, um, <laughs> that is a great start. Does anybody else wanna add to that? Yes, um, I think there's a, uh, we talked about the doctors and insurance companies uh, trying to get off cheap. Another concern that has been raised to me, and I sense it, is that people, will want to uh, force you or coerce you to take the medication because it's inconvenient for them. I'm talking about family members, friends, or caregivers, which is in the same sort of space as this question. How does one deal with the fear of being bumped off if you're not quite ready? Um. Uh, I have something about the um, the uh, insurance companies and the hospitals. Um, Angela, do you ever think it is good to ask whether they're um, people who are in wheelchairs or they're just people in the in the audience uh, to ask them where they got that information that hospitals and insurance companies are uh, behind this in order to make a lot of money? Uh, do you ever counter it first or not? Um, I have not. I will tell you, I was recently watching the Nevada hearing. Um, I'm not sure if you are coming, if you are aware of this, Cindy, or not. But um, I guess somebody who lived in California who had uh, terminal cancer had requested um, some other sort of treatment they wanted their insurance to pay for. And they received what's called like an explanation of benefits um, and their insurance had sent them a letter and said, we're not going to cover this, but here is a list of the um, treatment options or, or um, end of life care that we will cover. And medical aid in dying was listed as an option. Um, and so sometimes that people will say like, oh, they're just trying to kill me. They want me to take medical aid in dying. When it's really an explanation of benefits of what your insurance covers and what it doesn't. But do you know that that is an issue? Did you know that, Cindy, is that where you're going with this? I, or? I, yes, I did know that. Okay. And I think it started with a case in Oregon, too. Same thing happened to a, a, a woman. Uh, at least that's what I remember years ago. This has been brought up uh, when I have been. Um, but I tried to explain why that uh -huh. they haven't heard the whole story. Mm -hmm. There's much more I, to that story, but I think, uh, uh, should we not, because I think they're just hearing that and they mm -hmm. don't have any evidence behind it. 
I would agree with you. A lot of people just hear something, a bit of it, and then it freaks them out and they get fearful. So they'll, they'll repeat it. Um, just rumors. Yeah. And I, I think that it was a requirement underneath mm-hmm. the ACA that the explanation of benefits be sent out. So it's, it was to improve healthcare. Uh, but I think it worries people. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's totally fine to talk about that. I am somebody who likes to give out information um, and educate others, you know, so it's it's totally fine to talk about that. We actually have like a little fact sheet on it as well that I can send out to you all um, when I send out the final email. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, I just learned about our fact sheet on it. So any other comments on this question? Yeah, um, I think as far as how to um, address this challenging question, um, this it seems like the source really of me- choosing medical aid in dying, one of the basic premises is has to do with quality of life. So, you know, I knew I, I became aware as I was thinking, filling out the dementia pr- provision in the toolkit that I wasn't so worried about physical lack, you know, if um, I had lost my physical abilities, that didn't bother me as much as if I lost my mental abilities. So we all have an idea of what our quality of life is. And so whether or not you're in a wheelchair really becomes rather immaterial at that point. Um, Because if you feel your life is valuable, uh, it really doesn't matter what that looks like to anybody else. And to me, that seemed like a way in to someone, you know, like for me, the example, uh, you know, I really wouldn't mind not being able to walk as long as I could think. So <laughs> it seemed like a way to align myself with someone who might see me as a very different person. Yeah, and it's interesting um, because we have people, I mean, we have volunteers who um, use wheelchairs and are very passionate about trying to get medical aid and dying passed. Um, And it's similar, I would say, to kind of the Catholic Church where, um, if you're not familiar, the disability organizations um, can be pretty against medical aid and dying. And it is because of historical uh, medical treatment, right? That they have, that people living with disabilities have gotten from the healthcare systems. So we all, like we internally, a lot of the staff will often talk about like, we 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 understand the fear of it. Um, however, it it is still just, I know somebody that would say like, feelings are not always facts, right? So like, again, we always point back to the Oregon law um, that in 25 years, there's never been an in- an instance where there's been coercion. There's felony charges that will get charged against you if somebody else is trying to get you to take medical aid and dying. Um, doctors are t- trained also to recognize this and, you know, bring you in separately. So it's just you having the conversation with them to make sure that it's, you know, truly just your decision that you want to use medical aid and dying. Um, and it's just, you know, there's all these safeguards in the law to protect against it. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about too lately is um, one of the safeguards initially in the Oregon law that we had was there was a 15 day waiting period. Um, so the Oregon law had a 15 day um, waiting period. You had to wait 15 days, you make your first request, you wait 15 days, and then you make your second request. And that was a safeguard that they had put in there um, so that pa- like patients, it allowed them time to think more about whether or not they wanted medical aid and dying. So Oregon collects lots of data. It's one of the only states that collects any sort of data around. Uh, definitely other states collect a little bit about like who's using it, but they really collect a lot of information. Um, and what we have found over the last 25 years is when people make the request for medical aid and dying, they have often thought very long about it. They, you know, it's not just like on a whim, I want medical aid and dying. You know, they've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. A lot of times people have had cancer before, have gone in remission and, you know, cancer will come back. They've had plenty of time to think about it. And what the 15 day waiting period was actually doing is people would make the request 
And then unfortunately, a lot of people were passing away in that 15 day waiting period, which is now why we've gone and reduced it to two days. Um, and in some states, it can be waived if they don't think the person's going to um, be alive for the 48 hours. Um, so there, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this before. It's not usually, sometimes people like to think it's this like, you know, irrational decision that somebody's emotional and making it. That isn't the case. Um, could you address patients' concerns that once they have the prescription, then some family may put pressure on them to take it for convenience or inheritance purposes? So I, um, can look into that for you, Hans, and send out some information in it. I don't know that I'm as well versed to talk about that, um, but I can look into that. I do know that there is, again, some concern about patients getting the medication, um, that again, that there's pressure from family members, but again, that is when the doctors call them in and ask them one-on-one -on -one if you wanna take it. I'm not sure about once they have the prescription though and putting pressure on it. Unless you have any feedback on that, Hans. No, that's that's a concern uh, some old people especially might have. You know, the kids want the money, the insurance, whatever. And if they've elected to consider this route, once some doctor has approved this, they could be coerced. Or the other question is if the, the converse, that some patient wants to uh, have a prescription and the family and maybe the person is bed bound unable to get out of the house and the family or a member of dissenting family refuses to fill it for the patient mm -hmm. in other words blocks the patient wishes another potential side I guess I'm asking these questions because I don't want to find myself in a discussion on this especially in a public discussion and mm -hmm. not have uh, sort of really solid answers to allay people's concerns. Yeah, I'll look in and see if we have any sort of, if people have a great answer for that. It's a lot more to do what we t would typically get asked is if before somebody gets the medication, that somebody else would be pressuring them to get it. Because again, once you get the medication, most people are very far advanced. Um, into their illness. So it's, most people usually have just a couple of weeks. Um, so there's not been a ton. I have not heard a lot of stories ever, actually. Um, it might be a fear that people have, but I've never heard of somebody getting the medication um, and then the family trying to take, make them take it earlier. Um, uh, so, Angela? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, one thing about that, um, I'm curious. In uh, several of the films I've seen, um, a, a, a compassion and choices person actually was at the home when it was done. Or another film, it showed uh, uh, actually a doctor. Do you know how, I mean, that might be able to allay uh, um, fears if we knew that there was somebody from another organization or a doctor or a nurse that was actually there. So if somebody was trying to pressure a person or um, that we could at least say that, but I, I'm not sure that's the regular course. I would say the majority of people who take medical aid and dying are enrolled in hospice. Um, however, some people, I've known a couple of people that we have as storytellers um, who it, they just wanted it to be the two people I'm thinking of in particular, it was both women and they just wanted to take the medication with their husband. One um, couple went into the mountain and watched the sunset together um, and took the medication. And another um, gentleman and his wife, she wanted to like, she had a farm and she wanted to go sit out by the farm and take it. So it's, we, we don't want to necessarily say that somebody has to be there with you because we want to honor what, however, somebody does want to pass. Um, but I would say a lot of people, there will be, even when they have hospice, sometimes the staff will leave the room when they take it just because of the requirements from the hospice um, and then come back in. But so I the majority of people, there are usually like a clinician of some type around. Um, but 
we don't make it's not part of the law that somebody has to be there if that makes sense yes thanks can i contribute can i say something the, the yeah. other thing i think you need to keep we need to keep in mind is what we're talking about is the medication has to be requested by the person because they're mentally capable but you have to have less than six months to live you have to have a terminal illness you're going to die soon so coercion by family members means they're trying to get there an extra week or two days or a month earlier it can't be given to somebody who's not already lined up to pass away. So it's not something that could be done because we wanted to get rid of Uncle Harry. Um, Uncle ha Harry has to be pretty close to passing away before this would even come into play. So I don't know that the co coercion issue, it's not a way to get rid of your relatives, in other words. It's, it's a scare tactic. I hear mm -hmm. it all the time right. from up, right. from opponents yeah. all all the time. Yeah, I think I think you have to ad address it like that. That instead of being a serious thing could happen. It, yeah, and that's just, my point. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, that that's exactly my point. People are going to try and throw up right. any kind right. of objection, moral, whatever, just yeah. to defeat your argument. And another thought I had though is that comes up is to, uh, or, or someone says they just, they're morally opposed or whatever to, to made. You say, well, you've always got the free choice at any time to just voluntarily stop eating. And you are, you can always get assistance with, with some sedation and comfort measures as a, as, a, as a fallback in case people are struggling with the idea of, you know, taking a death potion which is how some people might describe it. Is that, is that a reasonable default uh, or alternative to offer? Yeah, but I don't know that the people that are morally opposed to medical aid and dying would support voluntary stop eating and drinking either, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just gonna be a difference of opinion on, there are some people that just believe in preserving life at all costs, even if you're suffering to the extreme. Um, and those people are going to be the people that you're not going to change their mind. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when you're having those conversations and they say this, you know, I just say, okay, well, we'll just agree to disagree on this, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, you there is a qu question real fast about what is healthcare rationing. Um, so that is, um, you know, like there, there was talk about that around COVID. Um, when hospital systems were filling up and they started, you know, there was discussion about, um, you know, like, oh, should we, you know, make sure that we're getting people who are more likely to survive COVID, giving them the hospital rooms instead of elderly people. So that's like an example of healthcare rationing is like taking the resources that you have and providing them to people that you feel are more healthy and not giving it to people that are less healthy. Um, so Which if people you, with disabilities feel that they would be considered less likely to no. thrive. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Which has happened throughout history. So it, it it is, you know, I do have a lot of empathy with people. Um, and like I said, individual people living with disabilities generally support um, medical aid and dying, depending on, I think we just had a recent poll in Massachusetts that like 79% of people living with disabilities support medical aid and dying. Um, but a lot of the disability orgs have just been against it from the very beginning. So any other questions or comments around this? Um, I hate to hog the thing, but let me just ask one more question. Uh, I, I confess I have not yet given a public talk on this, or at least not on MAID and be said, but on death and dying lots of times. Um, what would one do if, especially in a state like Utah, there are people in the audience who just will not stop heckling? That They're not there mm. really to learn. They're there really to disrupt and close the meeting down. How does one diplomatically, respectfully, and effectively deal with people like that? Just out of curiosity, have you had something like that happen when you presented in other 
Eric, like on other topics in Utah? I know you've talked about it a little bit. Yes. No, no, but I'm I'm used okay. to university campuses uh, yeah. and political uh, meetings where people have no intention of coming, as I say, to do anything other than close down the, the meeting, shut up the speaker or whatever. Uh, and that, that's, I suppose, my biggest fear. How would I handle a, in a public meeting uh, individuals like that? I've not had personal experience of it, though. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing this up. And I, there's another thing I want to say, because um, you said you haven't given a presentation yet. I, w I just want to acknowledge that everybody on this call, some people have had, Cindy has been um, in this movement for a long time. Other people might be very new. Um, so I'm really encouraging everybody. It doesn't matter. There's no, you know, there's no, um, what's the saying? dumb questions there's no you know like whatever whatever kind of questions you have feel free to ask them um and then when we do this kind of presentation i don't want i know i talked about this on our last train the advocate i don't want people to be this to worry you that these are the kind of questions you're going to get all the time um i i honestly i haven't ever gotten any of these questions when i have gone out and give presentations this is just, we want to make sure that you're prepared and kind of thinking about this stuff so that you're ready to go. Um, so back to the heckling question. I have not, you know, I haven't, again, I think I shared this last time. I used to work for an elected official, um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with heckling. Um, but we usually were able to get them to, you know, leave the room. Um, and my fear, because I worked for an, uh, I worked for a United States senator for nine years, um, and my fear when I initially went to go speak, one of my first presentations I did here in Arizona um, was out in the town called Mesa, um, and I knew the woman from my previous job, and I knew that she was um, part of the LDS community, and I was really feeling fearful that like. I was just going to talk about our dementia um, provision that we have, and I, I was already nervous because I knew she hadn't agreed all the time with my previous boss and that, you know, we could kind of bump heads and she used to call us out in a political setting. It was not that case at all um, when I went and presented about this and somebody in the audience um, I didn't bring up medical aid and dying at all. It's not part of my presentation that I do in Arizona. Um, because Arizona um, is not anywhere near to passing medical aid and dying. Um, so what we have found to be more effective is to talk about just advanced care planning and end of life options. Um, what does typically happen when I do present on that, and I never again bring up medical aid and dying, is somebody in the audience will bring up medical aid and dying. Um, so like in this pre presentation, um, somebody brought up like, well, what about that medication that you can take? And I at first tried to just play dumb and I kept looking over at this woman, Sally, and I was like, oh my gosh, she's gonna like lose her mind if I start talking about medical aid and dying. And I kept trying to like downplay it and be like, you know, um, I'm not sure, you know, what you were talking about. And then she's, or, you know, what you can take in Oregon. And she really, there was no way out of it. And I just started finally, like, oh, okay, so like medical aid and dying. And I just give them the information on it, right? And say, this isn't authorized in Arizona. It is in Oregon, you know, and you need two doctors. You need to, I just tell them that, you know, the stuff that we ask you to remember. So the six month um, prognosis, terminal illness, you need two doctors and you have to have full decision-making capabilities. And that usually ends it. Um, and we have somebody in California who works, um, she, her, in general, she works with um, patients who speak Spanish, um, who have cancer, and she will talk about medical aid and dying is authorized in California. So she'll often say, like, I list this on my, um, you know, as part of my presentations when I go out, I tell people medical aid and dying. And um, that can be another population where you get a lot of pushback about medical aid and dying. And she just will say, like, you know, I understand if you don't agree with it. Um, and she's like, but it is an authorized end of life option here in California. And my job is to educate and inform and that's what I'm doing. And that usually stops it. So 
if you just go back to kind of, I'm just here to educate and inform, you know, and it's fine if we agree to disagree. So I don't know if that's helpful. I don't well, think, oh, go ahead. Who's that, Cindy? Yeah, I just want to say, I want to reassure everyone, because as you know, I've been doing this for many, many years. I have never had heckling. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, I've been at universities. I've been uh, in medical areas. I've been, I mean, there's just run the gamut of churches and whatever. So, uh, gosh, um, um, what's what's his name? The who asked this question starts with an A, not author. Um, um, Hans, Hans, Hans. Yeah. Uh, that was a great question. Uh, but um, I I can reassure you, I'm in Texas. You're in Utah. <laughs> people that we're dealing with pretty much the same and i have never had that that's you very know, reassuring yeah you know where we if we are going to get heckling where it is is um at the capitals um so different times when people are trying to give testimony to say when we're trying to pass a law and people are trying to give testimony sometimes there'll be the opposition will be there kind of heckling the people trying to give testimony um, yeah. But it's never been at a presentation. And again, when you're in that situation, um, their legislators will usually also shut it down um, or somebody somebody will shut it down quickly. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, so the next question I'll put in here, too, so you can read it. Okay, so you are presenting at a local religious institution and all is going well. During the Q&A, the person raises their hand and says, we worship God in our community and there is no place for medical aid in dying. One's death, like one's life, is God's plan. Suffering is also part of God's plan and is part of one's redemption. You seem like a nice person. How can you support this? So what issues do you need to think about, again, in formulating a response to this? Well, as you said before, that we're providing information and options, um, that this is not a religious stance. That is great. Any other feedback? Thoughts? Yes, I heard once that in the Jewish tradition, um, uh, speeding up the life of a terminally ill suffering person according to the Talmud is not prohibited so I think if one can use uh, a tradition like that very closely aligned to Christianity and point out that different religions have different positions on things like this and we respect them all we're not proselytizing or preaching anyway we're just as you say offering these alternatives for those whose beliefs are at variance with uh, the, this particular church. Is, is that reasonable? Yeah, I think, again, there are going to be people who you're not going to change their mind. And this person who's asking this question is probably one of them. Um, but I, yeah, I think just, you know, stating that different people, I mean, I've had it where like, if you're thinking, not in talking about medical aid and dying, but like, um, you know, people get so set in their ways that they don't believe that you should believe in other religions, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think just saying, you know, we're educating and informing you of this. This is a legal option in your state. And our, my role here today is to give you the information so that you can make an informed decision. Um, and I actually honestly just try to stay away from any of the religious talk again, because this person is not going to be somebody who is going to change, you're going to change their mind, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, and it, I don't know, can, can you say something, can you get in, can you bring up the issue that uh, there are different views of the specifics of God's plan, which uh, may include suffering, but we do a lot of things 
God has provided, perhaps God has provided a lot of options to, to, to moderate suffering. And we do that. We do, we, it's, we at times are willing to reduce our suffering by medications we take and all. And so maybe this is just another alternative, but it depends on one's belief, I think, of what God's plan really is. Yeah, I mean, I think that yeah, sounds like pretty non-judgmental, um, but also just be my thinking a lot with this question is that this person might just want to, I, I think it would depend if you feel like this person might want to yeah. keep arguing with you over everything. Yeah. Um, but I think that is said very nicely. And then Mary, do you yeah. have your hand up? Yeah, um, it's kind of been said, but I, I would... My response would be what we're asking for here is choice. And if you choose because you believe it's it's um, what God wants, if you choose to let your final illness take its course and to do nothing to end your life any sooner than, than God is, is going to take it, I will defend your right to do that to the bitter end. Um, that is your choice, but even within the same church or the same faith community, there are shades of different understandings of, of God's will and God's God's um, rules. So we're about offering choices to people who choose to to take um, medical aid in dying in in their situation. Yeah, that is really great. I always talk about that too. If you've ever seen our dementia addendum, um, one of the options is I want to live as long as possible. Um, and you want like CPR and you want to be on a ventilator. And it could be like, you know, I'm no longer able to bathe myself and get out of bed or feed myself. And I no longer remember anyone and I'm angry all the time and medication isn't helping. Like you can still say, I want to live as long as possible. Um, and we're all about just empowering people to chart their own end of life journey, however you want to do that. So, And just to build on what Mary said, now I think about it, even within the Christian church of the thousand denominations or more that there are, there are quite diverse opinions on the use of medicine, like the Christ scientists or Jehovah's Witnesses who won't take blood, uh, the Quakers who don't baptize. So, yeah, within the family of Christian churches, there are very diverse opinions about how one lives one's life and seeks uh, therapy or aid of any kind. Right. Thanks, Mary. I just want to um, recognize, so it's 11.57, um, and I know this was, or it's 11.57 my time. Um, and... So if you have to go, you can go. If you want to stay, we can go through the other two questions. It's okay. Yes, Does please. anyone want to stay? Yes, please. Yes. I'll, okay. I'll yeah, have to I drop, stay. but this was really helpful. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, so here's the next question. So you're speaking at a local retirement community about end of life options. At the talk, a staff person raises their hand um, the minute you introduce the idea of medical aid and dying. The person says, our community does not condone assisted suicide or euthanasia. We offer a full range of palliative care and there is no need for assisted suicide here. So again, what issues do you need to think about when formulating a response? Mary, is your hand still up or is it just up from last time? Okay. Well, as, as always, as you have said, um, that is not what we advocate, um, that, that um, we're talking about medical aid in dying, should a person choose it. But their, um, uh, Rosemary, their facility may not allow it. There are some facilities. Oh, absolutely! Even, even in states where it's legal, of so course. wouldn't that would that be one of the first questions, uh, Angela, that we would have to know? 
I actually think that's pretty good that it, it would come up because you'll be surprised how many people are in a facility and they have no idea that if they wanted to access medical aid and dying, they would not be able to do it in that facility. I'm, I'm always surprised by that. Yeah, I was actually very happy because in California, they just put out um, a provider notice that anyone living in an assisted living facility has the right to take medical aid and dying. Um, and that staff can opt out of certain, like staff doesn't have to bring them the medication and they don't have to be present. Um, but it is your right to take it if you're in an assisted living facility. But like Colorado has different laws around it. Um, I think what I would do um, is kind of go back to uh, talking about um, that we also don't condone assisted suicide or euthanasia, um, you yeah. know, and then <laughs> and explain um, what medical aid and dying is. Um, but that's probably how I would start. Um, and I will share that there are some people and again, everybody's different, right? So there are people in palliative care um, and there are people who work in hospice who think like, you don't need, as Bill, I think you we were talking about this. Some people believe, you know, you don't need medical aid in dying if you have hospice because hospice will provide you the comfort care. Mm -hmm. um, however, that's not always true. Um, hospice does a great job um, and palliative care can be great. Um, and we look at it like medical aid in dying works along with hospice and palliative care. And there are people in hospice and palliative care who agree with that. And there are some people who are, you know, for their own reasons, still aren't totally on board with that. So what state did you say that there is now a law that every facility has to uh, allow for it? Um, so it's California, but it's, California. Um, yeah, independent living and assisted living. Um, but if you were to go towards like the skilled nursing, then they can start making their own rules. Um, around it. But if you're in assisted living or independent living, they said that it's your right to take it. Hmm. On Thank on the you. question, you you mentioned the, the word that the red flag word that you use that I think I would uh, discuss is the word suicide. Whenever you throw the word suicide in there, I think you have to come back and, and, and clearly say this is explain what it is and why it's not suicide. Can I offer a, a, a side issue here? A neighbor of mine passed, brought over a little, a little blurb out of the USA Today last week. They know my, believe my, what I'm doing here. Anyway, they came by with a, with a little blurb out of USA Today and said, did you see this? And it was just a little bulletin that said in Vermont, they have just passed the law that has taken out the waiting period for medical, medically assisted suicide. The Associated Press called it, it twice in this little blurb, medically assisted suicide. <laughs> I was amazed that the Associated Press, it almost sounds like they're politically motivated to call it suicide, or is it an accident? Are you familiar I, with the, that? I don't think it's an accident. Um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah I don't know that's that. what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know why, I don't know that it is, um, I don't know if it's meant to be very like mean in doing it or if that's what they just know people kind of know of it. As, but I know that people have talked to Associated Press several times and asked them to say Maclade and dying. So, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I just think there's a huge organization with a huge impact. And the fact that they choose, chose to use the word suicide in there just for me was a huge red flag. Like, they need to be brought on board. I mean, to be objective, but yeah, <laughs> whatever. I I have tried to get the Houston Chronicle to stop using that. They oh. refuse to do it. They won't oh. tell me why, but I will tell you why. My guess: suicide brings people's eyes, mm. and they want people's eyes to come on their newspapers yeah. or to read this article. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's my guess. Yeah, that might be with it with the AP too. It's just kind of about like things that draw people yeah. in. So I know because we have asked them. <laughs> Angela, it sounds as though Compassion and Choices needs to start lobbying 
the media too to stop <laughs> these scare tactics as well as our lawmakers, right? Oh yeah, I, we definitely try. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think the more people talk about medical aid and dying and people become familiar with that term, um, the more people will use it. But there's a lot of people that still, um, that are very, very supportive of this movement that still will use like right to die. Um, I don't know that we talked about it in here somewhere in one of these slides, they'll talk about death with dignity. And that is the name of the first law is in Oregon. It's the death with dignity law. Um, and we don't say death with dignity um, because that implies that the only way that we might view, the only way to have a death with dignity is to take medical aid and dying. Um, so that's something that like, you know, our founder helped create the death with dignity law, but it's just something over time that we have kind of gone away from just because we want to, however it is that you want to plan the end of your life, we think is the dignified way, you know? So, but a lot of people still will just say death with dignity, you know, and that's what a lot of people know medical aid and dying as. Um, so. It is very, very difficult. I think um, I just speak for myself as an aging adult it's very difficult to keep up with what you're supposed to say and what you're not supposed to say and why. So I think that can certainly use um, constant reminders, Angela. I think we all need that. Yeah, I mean, we um, we used to say choices a lot too. I mean, this is just a good example, right? So we used to say choice, I said our name, compassion and choices. Um, we used to say choices, 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 but a lot of people also will think about um, abortion when you talk about choices, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll also just, instead of using choices, we'll say end of life options instead options. of end of life choices. Um, just to, you know, to make it separate and that their first thing is not thinking abortion. So yeah, but it is difficult. And you know, the thing is, is like, we're, you know, we're all gonna say things and there are people who, you know, you might have conversations. I have a wonderful, wonderful volunteer in Colorado who would always talk about right to die. And the people that she communicated with all the time, they all used right to die, you know, and it wasn't um, controversial at all, you know, but it just kind of like thinking about these things and how, you know, it might come off to people that don't know who you are, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. We we just try to do the best we can. So I was gonna well, add, okay. I was gonna add another something as a personal experience on the inflamed words. When I first where I am now in Arizona, where I'm leaving for the for the summer, um, I ran into a, a lady walking my dog that I knew very well from past, and I know she's a very conservative Christian di direction, uh, and I sort of mentioned the medical aid in dying that my, that Joanne, that I thought Joanne should have. And she says, oh, you mean assisted suicide? I just dropped it. I didn't say another word because I could say where I, I, okay, the same person now, after I, after I got to talking back and talking one night with her and when Joanne's story finally came out last week, I said, by the way, Joanne's story is on co compassion and choices and it has to do with medic medical aid and dying, I sort of explained, uh, two doctors, you know, and she's, oh, that sounds interesting and everything. And she read the story and she now says, oh, I understand what she, why she wanted that. Now, this is the person I initially dismissed because she said assisted suicide, but she read Joanne's story. Um, she gets it, I think. I don't think she's just, you know, humoring me i think she sort of i think she gets it now when she sees what it really is mm -hmm. i had that happen too when i was um giving a presentation in prescott um last month i don't even know what month i'm in um and somebody in the audience um hans your story i was nervous they were going to start heckling me because they started talking about um physician assisted suicide and I had said too in my presentation that this is not suicide. Like people are dying and they want to live. Um, and I talked about Brittany, um, you know, she was 29, 30 years old and had just gotten married and was talking about having a family. She wanted to live. She had a disease that was killing her. Um, 
and he kept talking about physician assisted suicide and but you know he was probably 85 years old and it wasn't like he wasn't at all trying to argue with me it's just that's what people have heard throughout all this time um is physician assisted suicide and i think a lot of people um think about like dr kevorkian right it, when that was around and calling it physician assisted suicide which is why we try to be so clear that like you take the medication yourself no doctor is giving it to you so well and angela, and angela you, you, sorry go ahead go, go ahead, ahead please well, I just want to make a quick, because we're on that topic, is uh, I understand what you're saying uh, about death with dignity. I, I understand that reasoning. Uh, of course, I am Texas death with dignity, and I got that early on when I was uh, uh, working with the National Center. But we have to remember and we have to honor that the second, you know, one of the largest organizations in this country that's been working, as you said, for 25 years or, and longer is the uh, Death with Dignity National Center. So I don't think that we want to, I, I understand, and I think people should say that every death you choose or anybody you want to end your life or go out with your life is, is, is a dignified death. But I also don't want it to be a um, where, where we are casting aspersions on that phrase, because frankly, when I use the term medical aid in dying, people will say to me, oh, yeah, you mean death with dignity. So that's just my two cents. Yeah, and I agree. Like, I don't like gung ho about it, but just internally when I'm talking to people, it's why I don't say death with dignity. Right. It's because we have had people push back and say, like, so you're saying my you know, the way my mom died wasn't dignified because she didn't take this, you know. And if you choose not to take medical aid in dying and suffer, that that is not a dignified death. So. You're, you're absolutely right, because yeah. I've, I've had that on, on our Facebook page. People will say that. Uh, so I do understand. I just don't want it to be seen in a negative light because yeah. of the reasons I put. And while we're on Thank the topic you. of... of uh... Kevorkian, not for now, but maybe for a future session on training, Angela. Um, I, I, another issue that I worry about is that someone will say, oh, you're the old Hemlock Society, and what a what a uh, nasty organization that was, and the founders were called into question, and all that kind of stuff. So I assume you have some canned responses to make sure that it's very clear that we are not Hemlock, just with a new name. Um, for, I'm not, yeah, and I'm not even like, I know that Hemlock Society has been around for a long time, but I don't know a ton about their history. Um, and I know that there's other groups too. Um, there's another group called Final Exit um, that does things very differently. So what I do is just, when I have been asked about stuff like that, because people will ask me about Final Exit. They'll say like, what's your opinion on Final Exit? Um, and I do get asked that occasionally, not a lot, but occasionally if I'm giving presentations and I always just say like, you know, I'm not here to talk about final exit. I'm here to talk about compassion and choices. And this is what we do. So but I can just, see if there's. Yeah, just, just if you just Google Hemlock Society, you'll find out there's quite a lot of scandal about the founder who it is alleged bumped off his wife to marry somebody else when she was sick. And eventually, the, the and some embezzlement of funds. I mean, there's quite a, a check in history. Whether any of it is true, I don't know. It could be just all pure uh, undermining of the original organization. But it is out there. And I think, again, I like to be prepared for anyone that has done a bit of homework before they come to a meeting with the intention of uh, just causing trouble. Yeah, I'll shut up. I, I'll shut up now. Well, yeah, and I'll just go back to two. Like, I like to talk about like what I am well versed in talking about is what I'm here to present on people about. Like, there's no way you're going to be able to be prepared for every single question. Um, but that's how I just redirect people back to the presentation and redirect people back to like what we're talking about, what medical aid and dying is. Um, I'm a big on redirecting. <laughs> Any other comments? 
Okay, one last question. Okay, so you are speaking at a local community center about end of life options, including medical aid and dying. During the Q&A, a person raises their hand and tells you that their mom has Alzheimer's disease and goes into detail about her mom's suffering and her stress in caring for her. The person complains with great feeling about the fact that her mom cannot take advantage of medical aid in dying if authorization happens. Um, so this actually comes up all the time. Um, but what kind of, what do you think we need to think about um, when formulating a response? Because remember, if you um, have Alzheimer's disease, um, you can still, if you, if you still have decision-making capabilities over your health, you can still, you can have a dementia diagnosis and you can use medical aid and die. But once you lose the decision-making capabilities, um, that's one of the safety guards in the law. Um, so, but we get this a lot, you know, but before I answer, I'll let you guys answer. Well, that you are absolutely right. It comes up all the time, and of course, uh, you, I, I usually say, "I'm I'm so sorry that your your mother is mm -hmm. facing that medical condition, and that the family uh, is suffering along with her." And then I'll say, "Unfortunately, um, if your mother is past the co the legal uh, definition of competency, uh, she would not be able." But I do understand um, how you would like that to be part of it. But in the United States now, you, the, the patient has to be competent to be able to access medical aid and dying. And that usually that's about all I need to say, and they understand it. And it is a safeguard. It's important that there are safeguards in place, as you said, Angie. Right. I think you, I think you would, both those are points. And I think you'd have to sort of stress that these safeguards are there to provide protection for the program and to make sure that it isn't abused. Um, it's unfortunate that some people aren't going to qualify for it, but. Um, but it, it's a certain, it's a very much an incentive to start thinking about our, you know, our end of life years and making some thinking about it and with our family and making plans uh, to, you know, without disparaging this particular person who's raising their hand, you know, to think about to uh, be able to um, exercise these options before it's too late. And also, I think that's a very good point, Marsha. You can also perhaps say what uh, what options do remain for them, what you know, what options they do have to help alleviate that stress and suffering if they choose. Well, I would be interested in hearing that answer because once they're past competency, unless they have um uh, a, a dementia addendum uh, where where they say they do not want to be forced fed, which would then uh, hasten their death. Uh, they don't have any, I would love to hear if somebody has an answer to that, Rosemary's issue. It's something that, that I have thought about and I don't know the, the answer. But there is always uh, VSED, but I understand there that you would need to have support of family and friends uh, to do that once you perhaps lose your cap mental capabilities. You also, to do VSED too, you have to um, yeah. have decision-making capabilities as well. Right. Yeah. What about um, just also this, the option of stop eating and drinking? is also an option maybe? Um, so yeah, so sorry, we were using acronyms over here. Voluntary stop <laughs> eating and drinking as we said. Um, yeah, gotcha. so you have to have um, full decision-making um, capabilities when you choose to do VSAD. 
Though I do know people who will get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, um, but before it progresses. So with medical aid in dying, you have to have a six month um, prognosis that you're going to die within six months. For VSED, you don't need that. So if you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and you start feeling like you're going to like, you you know, it's getting worse and you don't want to wait until the point where you cross this line where you're making the, the you're no longer able to make healthcare decisions. I know people will do VSED at that time. So before it gets too bad, even though you don't have a six month prognosis, you could go on to live for another couple of years perhaps, right? Um, but there isn't a ton of options once you have advanced um, dementia. Not really at all. It's usually just comfort care. Um, we do have a, um, we're going to go into it week four about our dementia provision that we have, um, where you think about it ahead of time and have those conversations with your family and your doctor so that, again, they know that, like, if I get to the point again where I'm angry all the time and medication isn't helping, um, that it's not the same as V said, but you know, like if you're putting a spoon to my mouth um, and I, you know, have very advanced dementia and I'm turning my head, um, I would have written down ahead of time while I still had my decision-making capabilities. I don't want you to force feed me, right? Um, so there isn't so much you can do for the person that like, if, if this person in the audience is talking about their parent that you can do to relieve their suffering, but there's ways that you can help prepare for yourself in the future. Um, some things that we haven't talked about that I can share with you that wasn't in this presentation that you wouldn't know um, is what, what I'll talk about. Because a lot of times people come to me and they want to change the law to include Alzheimer's. Um, and that is not something that legislators are on board with at all. Um, that is not something that a lot of doctors would be on board with um, because you kind of are crossing the line then about euthanasia, right? And making a determination. Mm -hmm. um, so like, again, in California, which is considered to be a pretty liberal state, they have a sunset um, provision that in it got, um, it used to be 2025. Mm -hmm. And when they passed the um, Improvement Act, um, they extended it to... 2031, because there's not even enough people in California making the law um, that had full confidence in medical aid and dying, and that there wouldn't be any sort of like, um, you know, errors or mistakes. Um, so you're thinking of like one of our most liberal states have concern about this law still as it is. So if you are going to go in and try to start adding Alzheimer's to it, that's going to raise a bunch more red flags with legislators. Um, and then again, if that were to even get passed, um, when doctors have been pulled about it, they're not very willing to say that they would be in support of that either. But I think you answered all correctly. I always, I mean, I, my grandmother died from Alzheimer's. Um, I have a lot of empathy for people, you know, who are, have Alzheimer's and people who are caring for somebody who has Alzheimer's, um, a lot of empathy. So um, I think that you never go wrong. I think having empathy when people are asking you questions, um, even the, you know, the one that disagreed with you that felt like, you know, God should want me to suffer. You know, you can always have empathy for others. Um, yeah. Uh, anything um, else? Uh, I just want to uh, ask you, how close do you think New York is getting uh, to passing? Have you heard any scuttlebutt? <laughs> um, a little bit. Let me. Um, 